It's a unique time in the life of our church. As we think about a new pastor and you that may be a guest this morning saying, but who are you? <laughs> well, I'm still the pastor of Seminole First Baptist Church and will be until right before the new pastor comes. But we uh, just a unique time since I'm retiring that the church has allowed me to stay on in this role and then uh, the transition team search for and find a new pastor and I'm grateful that they've allowed me to do that and I get to be here with you until close to that time. So two weeks from the day, um, the young man that may be my um, successor will be here and preaching for you and you'll get a chance to meet him. This is a time for prayer. Uh, to seek seriously God's will for your church, our church, as well as for this young man's life. And so let me encourage you to do that. You'll be, you've got something, I think, last week, a prayer guide, and uh, they'll still be there. And really encouraging you, beginning on the 12th, which is a week from today, that you'll begin that whole week as a time of prayer and praying for this whole transition period, this tra whole transition process um, as God leads Seminole First Baptist Church. Uh, I appreciate the transition team. They have worked hard and done a lot of hard work and, and, and a lot of hard prayer seeking, as they said, God's man and God's time. This morning, if you get your, your uh, Bibles and open with me to the third chapter of Proverbs, and also if you have your listening guide that's inside your bulletin there, I want you to see that God calls you to faithfully manage your life for Him. God calls you to faithfully manage your life for Him. This is wise stewardship. This is what wise stewardship is all about. This is what it means to be a steward. And this is also what stewardship is. It's how you faithfully and wisely manage your life and your possessions for God as you would begin to understand that all that you are and all that you have has come from God. And indeed, it is God's. So that all that you are and all that you have, you don't own. You're not owner, you're a manager. Another word for that is trustee. Another word is, is steward. You are a steward of what God has given you, your life and everything that you possess, your time, your talent, your testimony, and your treasures. All of that utilized for God and for His purposes. As again, you're not an owner. I'm not an owner. We're merely stewards. And as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Why stewardship is faithful stewardship. This morning, I want to, us to hear from one of the wisest, richest, and most successful people who ever lived. His name is Solomon. He wrote this book called Proverbs, with the vast majority of what we find here in the Proverbs. And he speaks to us this morning about wise stewardship. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word? We'll be reading the first 12 verses of chapter 3 of the book of Proverbs. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and, esteem, and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of, your, of, your, of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest His correction. For whom the Lord loves, He corrects, even as a father, the son, in whom He delights. Father, we ask that You would now bless not only the reading of Your Word, but also the proclamation of Your Word. Father, that Your Holy Spirit would come and fill this place. And Lord Jesus, You Yourself would reign supremely in this place. 
that the words we hear would not be mine, but would be yours. And that your Holy Spirit would cause these words to penetrate our hearts and dictate how we'll live. Because you love us and want what's best for us. Because we love you and want to offer you our best. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Psalm has written wise counsel for life in these first 12 verses. Just real quick overview of those. In the first two verses, he tells us that we need to obey the counsel he's giving us because that counsel has come from God. It's wise counsel. He then in verses 3 and 4 tells us that we need to steward our relationships by letting mercy and truth dictate how we relate to one another and how we relate to God. In verses three and, uh, in 5 and 6, he reminds us that we're to trust God with all that we are. That's why stewardship, trusting God with all that you are. In verses 7 and 8, he calls on us to fear the Lord. To fear the Lord is to take God seriously and to respond to Him appropriately. In verses 9 and 10, he speaks to us about honoring Him with our possessions and then in verses 12 and 11 and 12, he, he encourages us as wise stewards to accept what God is seeking to give us when he chastens us. Because he chastens us for our good. He wants to correct us. And if we're wise, we'll accept that corrective. That corrective. Now I want you to understand that stewardship is about all of life. And it, sometimes though when you hear the, somebody mention that word steward, you think immediately, uh-oh, we're going to hear a sermon on tithing and giving. You might. But stewardship is more than just that. But stewardship is that. Stewardship deals with all of your life, every aspect of your life, your, your social life, your, your family life, your life at the office, how you go about your day, your relationships. It's, it's everything. But it does include your possessions. It, it does involve your finances. The question becomes why? Why then should we talk about all these things? You know, well... One reason is, if you're going to preach the whole counsel of God's word, you have to talk about this. But there's another reason that's even better than that, and Jesus talked about stewardship of your possessions. As a matter of fact, if you go back and look at his parables, you'll discover that one-third of his parables were about how you manage your possessions and how you manage wealth and your attitudes towards those. He talked about money and possessions and wealth more than any other subject, including heaven and hell. That should tell us something about how important this, this issue is. Stewardship also is discipleship. If you're growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're growing in the relationship with God, then you will seek to be a wise steward and a faithful steward in what you're doing. Because how you manage your possessions, your resources, your wealth, how you manage that is directly related to, to your own spiritual growth and development. Finally, stewardship really is about life. Listen, you've got a household to take care of. You get so much money. How do you live within your means? That's stewardship. That's managing things well. And so to get worked up over it because the preacher is going to talk about money is just simply foolish because we're talking about something that you need. Stop and think about our culture. Our culture was filled with financial advisors, bankers, stockbrokers, money managers, venture capitalists, CPAs, lawyers, all with a whole host of counsel to us about how to utilize and wisely utilize our resources. And nobody ever gets worked up about it until the pastor stands up to talk about it. Isn't that interesting? Well, God's got a lot to say about this, and he used this wise man, Solomon, to talk to us about wise stewardship. Wise stewardship is faithful stewardship. And so, therefore, the goal of faithful stewardship is to honor God. That's how verse 9 begins. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Honor the Lord. At the end of the service, we receive an offering. Now, we used to pass the plate. We're going to surprise you this morning and do it again, finally, for the first time since before COVID. But we've been talking to you about the, 
giving stations. And we remind you that you can give online. And we remind you that you can mail your offerings in. And there's a lot of ways that you can make sure that you bring what belongs to God back to God and, and encourage you to do so and to give. Why do we do that? To take care of the facilities? Well, your, your tithes and offerings help with that. To pay for salaries? Well, your, your tithes and offerings help with that. Because you need to pay your membership dues? I hope that's not what you're thinking. It's to honor God. It's to remember who God is and the place that he has in your life. The word in the Hebrew, this is written in Hebrew, the word in the, in the Hebrew for honor comes from a, a root word, a word that's root meaning has the idea of weight, heavy, to be weighted down or to be heavy. Um, it was used a lot of times to talk about a king. Whenever a king was coronated, he was weighted down with the crown. He was weighted down with his robe and his scepter and, and with the medallions and with all other kind of things, let alone his own personal wealth, his own coins, his rubies, his gems, and all those things. And the more weighted down he was, the more important he was, the more significant he was, the more powerful he was. That's how it was viewed in those days, to, to weight him down. Some of you are as old as I am, maybe a little bit older. You might remember in the late 60s and early 70s, somebody would say, Man, that's heavy. They were talking about it the same way we're talking here with the word to be heavy. It means that's important. That, that was profound. That was significant. A guy would even say, I've got a heavy date this weekend. And please trust me, it had nothing to do with her weight. <laughs> Every time we come to worship God, we weigh him down. We make him heavy with praise, with worship, with adoration, with dominion and power. All those things we ascribe to him, all those accessories of deity that we, that we acknowledge, he, we weight him down and make him heavy as we do so. As we come to honor God through our stewardship, we're doing the same. We're saying, Lord, this is the place that you have in our lives, a place of honor. But we also weigh him down with our trust. Because what we're saying is, as we come and bring these things to you, we can trust you with the things that we bring you. And we can trust you with our lives as we bring you these things. A faithful steward honors God. That's his goal. That's her goal. The medium of faithful stewardship is your possessions. Solomon wrote, honor the Lord with your possessions. That means the agency, the, the, the instrument, the vehicle that you use to honor God. Now that's not the only vehicle and instrument that you have, but it is an important one that you would honor God with your possessions. Now I'll remind you, we honor God with all that we are as well as with all that we have. When we talk about all that we have, we're talking about we have time, we have talents. You know, God has given, given you this day and you're to honor God with this day, 24 hours in this day. 60 seconds in every minute, 60 minutes uh, in every hour, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, four weeks, give or take, in a, in a, in a month, 12 months, in a year. All of that, every second of that whole time, honoring God with the time that he's given us and not wasting time. Boy, we can do that, can't we? Find more things to waste time on. We're to honor him with our talents. God has given you certain abilities that you have that others may or may not possess. It may be physical abilities. It may be mental abilities. It may be oratory abilities. Some people with their singing. Some people with their ability to play instruments. And then God gives to believers spiritual gifts that are a part of the talents that we possess. And all of that should be used to honor him. Your testimony. 
You have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. You talk about who, how you came to know the Savior. You talk about what it means to you today to, to walk with Jesus. That song that we talked about, it, it's not me, it's through Christ in me. That's, that's our testimony about how God works in our lives and the difference he makes in our lives. And the world needs to hear that. As they're wondering, why should they surrender their hearts to Jesus Christ? Why should they bow their knees and worship God? Because they need him. And we can talk to them with those testimonies. And God uses our testimonies to bring people to himself. But it's also through our treasures, through our possessions, through our monies, through our wealth. God says, honor me with those things. But why our money? You know why? Paul tells us, because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You see, the reason why God says to honor him with, the, with our resources, with our financial resources, our money, our wealth, our possessions, the reason, so that you and I will understand their true value. And to recognize, yes, those things are necessary, but they are not the most necessary thing in life. Nor are they the most valuable thing that you have. If your money is the most valuable thing that you have, I would suggest to you today, you are poor. You are impoverished. Because there's things that are more important than money. Yet we think there's no problem that cannot be solved if we just had a little bit more money. Let's be honest. How many times do we think, if I just had more money, I could take care of this problem? And yet sometimes if you look around and you'll see some of the richest people in the world, you'll see some of the most miserable people in the world. It was the fall semester of my senior year at Stetson University that I presented Marilyn with an engagement ring. Boy, I tell you what, I wowed her with that quarter carat diamond. It was all I could afford. And graciously she received it. That same semester, another couple in the circle that we ran around with, they got engaged also. And she sported a full carat diamond ring. My ego was a little hurt. I, it was bruised, there's no doubt about it. And I was embarrassed. And yet Marilyn just kept saying, I don't want a full carrot. This is what I want right here. And she kept telling me how much it meant to her. In June, we'll be married 45 years. And she still wears that quarter carat diamond. That couple that she sported the full carrot, they didn't get to celebrate their 10th wedding anniversary, their, their marriage didn't last that long. And all of a sudden I began to realize, you know what? That quarter carat diamond, the value is not in the diamond, it's what the, 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 what the diamond symbolizes. The love and the commitment that God has blessed Marilyn and I with for one another and it's so much more than the diamond or what it cost me to buy that quarter carat diamond. And we've got more than that couple, unfortunately, ever experienced with a full carat diamond. It helps us understand something. When we finally begin to realize, I don't own this. God does. I I'm just a manager. Yes, God gives me money because it does help to provide for my, my living. But my life is more than money. And there are more important things in life than money. But God still expects us to honor him in the way that we utilize our money. God is honored by the way that we get our money. You know what God's preferred method of you getting money is? You remember the old Smith Barney commercial? We make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. That's God's pre preferred way for you to get your money, that, that you earn it, that you work hard for it. It's something about people who work hard for what they have begin to understand something of the value of what they have. 
spent some time on an Indian reservation back in the late 90s out in uh, North Dakota. I saw some individuals that, that lived in government-provided housing that waited every month to get their welfare check. And they were living impoverished lives, and, and they, they just, the places they were living in were destroyed. They just did not, they didn't take care of them. And yet on that same Indian reservation, I saw individuals that had land and, and farmed that land, and they were ranchers on that land, and they had nice houses that they built with the money they earned and that they worked for and they took care of. And I saw the difference it makes between just giving somebody something and somebody earning it. The same thing goes for gambling. You will never find the kind of satisfaction, the kind of fulfillment in getting a big cash out as you will because you worked hard for what you've got. God's concerned about how we get our money and we honor him by how we get our money. We also honor God by how we guard our money. As I said, your, your, your money has some value to it. I, I understand that. It's not ultimate value, but there's value there. And you honor God by how that you guard it in the ways that you use it. I've seen people who are frivolous with their money. And they, can't, they never have enough money to make it to the end of the month. Because they don't utilize their money wisely. They don't guard it. You know, I think about that every time I think about the lottery. You know, the big the idea, I'm going to get a ticket. And years ago, they used to have a campaign that said, you, you, you know, you never know. And the idea was, you know, you may not win this time, but you never know when you will. So, so you need to buy a ticket every week because you're never going to win if you never buy a ticket. Hey, I want you to look at me. I've never lost not the first dollar. You know why? Because I've never been foolish enough to buy a lottery ticket. You may know somebody that's won the lottery. But if you do, if you know them personally, I've known of people that win. I don't know them. Do you know what the chances are of you winning the lottery? You have a greater chance of being struck by lightning in Florida than you do of winning the lottery. You have a greater chance of being attacked by a shark than you do of winning the lottery. What are you doing? Well, but you never know, Pastor. I do know. I do know that I've never lost a dollar. Not the first. Can you say the same? It, God cares about how we use our money as we guard it, but it's also as we try to guard the money because of its value, and so therefore we don't invest in things that are foolish. And quite frankly, if you think, well, my gambling is just investment, boy, that is extremely foolish. So I said, well, you, you, you've got money in the stock market. Well, my annuity is attached to the stock market. I get that. But, but you realize that my stock market has paid a lot better than your gambling has. Oh, I, I realize it's been terrible lately, watching it up and down and never knowing which way it's going to be, and it can fall tomorrow. I, I understand that. But still over the lifetime of the time I've invest, had money invested there, it still has produced better than gambling would have ever done me. It, it, it's how we guard it. We somebody says, well, yeah, but the, the value of that money and the, and the depreciation and, and the inflation and recession and all, the, I, I, I know, and we can get worked up in that. And that's one of the problems that Jesus warned us about. We start putting ultimate value in things that aren't ultimate. Ultimate value in things that aren't eternal. Things that can depreciate over time. That can be stolen from us and robbed. And you know what? There's a lot of people today who don't sleep well at night because they're so caught up with how do I guard my money and my value and my wealth. And God never intended for us to do that. He provides with us what we need and he asks us to trust him. And in trusting him we find peace, right? <coughs> trusting him and not trusting our stocks and our securities and our savings accounts 
Something else, though, there's another way we guard our money. Some people guard their money by hoarding it. You know what I'm talking about? This is mine, and I'll keep it. And they do nothing with it of any earthly or heavenly good. You know what I'm talking about. You see that person on the street, the sign that says, we'll, we'll work for food. And so you go up there and you, you say to them, okay, I can come out of the house, I got some things. No, just give me some money. I, I get it. I, I, I'm not going to probably th- toss my money out there either. I, I, I get that. I get all the same reasons that you do. But there are other times when I see people in need that I can't help, that I know that what I'm doing will help. The question becomes, am I helping them? Are you helping them? Because, you see, if we're not careful, we'll guard our money to the point that we'll become miserly and stingy and unloving. I will remind you that John said, you cannot say that you love your brother while watching him in need and do nothing about his need, a need with which you could help. James says, you have no faith at all. It's dead. It's useless. If you say that you have faith in God, but you can watch your brother suffer, and yet you could do something to help alleviate his suffering. God concerns, and you honor God by how you guard your money, but you also honor God by how you give your money. God gives us and blesses us so that we might give to others and bless them. That's the reason. Now, God does bless us with things so that we might enjoy them, and there's nothing wrong with that unless we're enjoying them to the exclusions of meeting needs and of making it possible for others to have needs met. I I want you to understand there is no greater need in a person's life than for Jesus. People need the Lord, and it won't cost you a penny to go tell somebody else about Jesus. But there are people that you and I cannot get to. And there are people who are willing to go to them, but they need the resources in order to help them to get there. You know why we give through the church? It's not to pay our tithes, I mean to pay our our membership dues. It's not just to take care of what's here. It's to be a part of the greater kingdom of God and what he's doing in the world today. And so we give so that other people might have the chance to hear about Jesus whether it be in Africa and Ghana or whether it be across the street in the United States. We give to meet needs and we honor God by the way that we give our possessions. Jesus sat in the temple one day. He took note of people coming to bring their contributions to the temple treasury. He noticed who gave. He noticed how much they gave, and he noticed how they gave. Jesus still watches to see how you and I give. It still matters. And so Solomon says, honor the Lord with your possessions. But he also gets a little bit more specific when he says the measure measure of faithful stewardship is the first fruits. You do so, you honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your increase. Your first fruits. We might debate this forever. Cain brought an offering and Abel brought an offering. Cain brought something from the field. Abel brought the firstlings of the fruit, of 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 the flock. You know what the first things were? They were the first lambs born in the flock that he, that he was shepherd over. Cain just brought something. Abel brought the firsts. Writer of Hebrews says the difference was faith. It was how they brought. <coughs> Abel apparently said, you know what? This is the first that God has given me. I'm so grateful for what God has given me. I am so dependent upon God. I'm going to give him back this first. And I'm going to trust that he's going to provide the rest of it. The first for the Hebrews was the first, the first fruits were the first heads of grain. The first produce that came out of the fields. 
before they gave, enjoyed it themselves, before they did anything else with it, before they sold it, they brought the first to the Lord and offered it to Him first. Do you know what the first offering commanded of us is in the Scriptures? It's the tithe. The 10%. Literally that first 10%. So that when the scripture says the tithe is the Lord's, it means that first 10% of your income, of your increase, belongs to God. And you honor God through the first fruits as you bring them. And someone says to me, Pastor, how on earth? I'm, I'm struggling to get through the end of the month. And I get to the end of the month and find more months than I've got money. How am I supposed to do that? A young seminarian was working at a local church close to the seminary where he went. He was an associate pastor there. And one day the pastor called him into his office and said, Son, um, your giving has become a little bit sporadic. Apparently he <laughs> paid attention to what his staff members were giving. My staff can breathe easy. I don't do that. But apparently this guy did. And he said, Pastor, I, I want to tithe. I, I try to tithe. But by the time I get to the end of the month, I don't have enough money. And the pastor said, I'm going to tell you how you do it. When you get your paycheck and you go deposit it, the first check you write is the Lord's tithe. And you'll always have enough. You know what I've discovered? By bringing the tithe to God's storehouse, Marilyn and I have always had enough. God says, trust me, try me, prove me, bring the first fruits, honor me with the first fruits, not the leftover, with, with the first fruits. That, that goes as you bring your tithes and offerings, but I think that also can, can talk about some other giving that we do in Jesus' name. I remember... Dr. John Sullivan was still serving the church in uh, Louisiana. My dad was a member at that church at the time and made sure that I got Dr. Sullivan's sermons. Uh, they came on cassette tapes. And as I was listening to one of those sermons one day, he talked about how they were going to start opening a, a, new, um, a new home for, for boys uh, to help those boys out. And they were going to provide those boys with a brand new set of clothing. And if you wanted to help with donations, you bring, go out and buy brand new clothing. He said, do not bring your leftovers. Don't bring used clothing here. We want those boys to have something that nobody else has ever worn, that they'll be the very first ones to put it on. Because most of those boys have never experienced anything like that. Not the leftovers, the first fruits. We honor God with the first fruits. But the reward of faithful stewardship is a full and overflowing supply. God promises, you honor me this way and, and your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will overflow with new wine. You see, some people say, well, you know, I can't afford to, be, to, to give. I, I can't afford to bring the tithe. I, I can't afford that. But here's something you need to understand about stewardship. Why stewardship? Why stewardship is always about faith. It's always about trusting God. That God can be trusted with what he has given you. And God can, and he entrusts you with what he's given you. So that you can trust him with what you give back to him. God cares about what you do with the 10%. God also cares about what you do with the 90%. But God promises you, you honor him he will honor you and take care of you. Marilyn and I have tithed throughout our married life. We've never gone hungry. We've never missed a mortgage payment. We're not wealthy by standards in the United States. Standards in the world, we're filthy rich. But in the United States, we're not wealthy by any of those U.S. standards. But God has never disappointed us. It's miraculous. 
it's supernatural. I don't know how God does it, but he does it. A man told me one day that he sat down and put on paper all of his expenses, and he said he proved to himself on paper he could not afford to tithe. But he said, you know what? God says, trust me in this. And so he says, I'm going to trust you, God. And he brought his tithe. At the end of the month, he had leftover. He said, it didn't make sense on paper, but I put it to practice and it worked. I don't know of anybody who can tell me that they were faithful with the tithe that had a different testimony. They've always been able to say, God has always blessed me with all that I needed and even a little more. Every time God encourages us to be faithful in our stewardship, the emphasis always tends to be on our giving, not our getting. Oh yes, he calls us to give, and then he promises what he'll do if we'll be faithful. Jesus promised in Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you. 1 Kings 4, 29-30 has a commentary on the life of King Solomon. And, Solomon gave, and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceeding great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand of the, on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all men, of, the, of all men of the east and of all the wisdom of Egypt. So the wisest man that's ever lived, the most successful man that's ever lived, the wealthiest of men who's ever lived has said this to you, honor God with your possessions. Honor him with the first fruit of your increase. And God will take care of you and more. But there's something else that we could add to this. And you will have demonstrated that you believe God and you acted on what you believed about God. Therefore, be wise, honor God, faithfully managing all with which he has blessed you. Speaking of the blessings with which God has blessed you, are you familiar with the blessings that are mentioned in Romans 6, 23? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The greatest gift, the greatest blessing God can bestow upon your life is received through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the gift of eternal life. What I've been talking about here this day really has more to do with those individuals that are already serious about a relationship with God. Stewardship is discipleship. It's a direct reflection on the kind of relationship you have with God and the growth and development you're having in that relationship. But I want to talk to some of you today that have yet to begin that relationship. The relationship gives by God offering you the best that you could have, eternal life. And it's found through faith in Jesus Christ. So this morning... Instead of talking to you about what are you giving, I want to know, what have you received? Have you received that? And it comes when you open your heart to Jesus. As you would trust him for your salvation, then you learn to trust him for all things. As you obey God in this, opening your heart to receive Jesus, you learn how to obey your heart in every other aspect of stewardship that God calls you to. Have you trusted Jesus? Do you know him as Lord and Savior of your life? Have you received the gift of eternal life? That's the first question. The second question, now that he has given you life, eternal life, are you honoring him with that life? Let's pray together. Father, I pray this morning 
that our eyes have been opened so that we might understand, if nothing else, we own nothing. We are merely managers, stewards, trustees, and we will give an account of our stewardship. So therefore, help us to determine that our number one goal is to honor you in all things. I pray this morning for one that needs to come to give their heart to Jesus. I pray this morning for one who already knows Jesus but is struggling in this issue of stewardship. Lord, I just simply pray that you would give them eyes to see the wisdom to understand and the courage to be obedient. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you have some decision to make about Jesus, we want to give you that opportunity. I'll be standing here. <coughs> As God has spoken to your heart, I invite you to come as we stand together and sing.